Hey everyone, it's Sarah the Registered Nurse RN.com, and in this video, I'm going to be doing an NCLEX review over pericarditis. This video is part of an NCLEX review series over the cardiovascular system, so if you're studying that system, be sure to check out the videos included in this series. So what I want to do in this video is I'm going to cover what pericarditis is, the causes, the different types, the complications, the nursing interventions, and the pharmacological aspects of caring for a patient with this condition. And then after you watch this lecture, you can go to my website, registerednursern.com, and take the free quiz that will test your knowledge on pericarditis. And a card should be popping up so you can access that. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about what is pericarditis. It is the inflammation of the pericardium layer of the heart. So what is the pericardium and where is it? Okay, first let's take the word pericardium. Peri means surrounds and cardium means heart. So it is a double layer sac that is filled with serous fluid, pericardial fluid, that surrounds the heart. And it plays a vital role with your heart. Number one, it anchors the heart to the mediastinum. It also protects your heart from infection. Say you get a lung infection. That protective layer protects that infection from being transferred from your lungs to your heart. It keeps the heart from overexpanding when that patient is experiencing fluid volume overload and it lubricates the heart while it beats. So you don't have those two layers rubbing up against each other, but that is what happens in pericarditis, which we'll go over here in a second whenever we talk about signs and symptoms. So let's look at the pericardium layer in depth. Okay, this whole part surrounding the outside of the heart is called the pericardium. And the pericardium is made up of two layers. So let's go over those layers. The outside part, which is the green that is outlining the heart, is called your fibrous pericardium. Then your next layer, which is um, illustrated here with the red, the blue, and the brown, is called the serous pericardium. But it is made up of two layers, and then it has fluid in the middle of it. So the red part is called the parotal pericardium. Then you have the serous fluid, which is known as pericardial fluid. And then after the serous fluid, you have the visceral pericardium, which is also called the epicardium. So what causes this condition, pericarditis? Number one, one cause that can cause this is an illness. Patient gets a virus or a bacteria, attacks the pericardium on the heart, and you get inflammation of it. Or trauma to the heart, like with a heart attack. Patients who've had an MI are susceptible for pericarditis or after heart surgery or a physical trauma to the heart with um, an outside injury or autoimmune, the body attacks itself, like in conditions like lupus, or it's completely unknown, it happens, they are not sure why it happened, so they consider it idiopathic. Now let's talk about the different types of pericarditis. Okay, you have acute and chronic. What is acute? Acute is where a patient develops pericarditis for less than six weeks. This is your most common type. Now, a lot of cases of pericarditis tend to be mild and they don't require treatment and they go away by, the, by itself. However, there is chronic and this happens over time and, can, and lasts more than six months. So the patient is struggling with this chronically. Now, because of this constant inflammation on the pericardium, this can lead to what's called constrictive pericarditis. And what happens with this, just as its name says, it, it is constrictive to how the heart can pump. Because what happens is that pericardium becomes thick and it develops into like scar-like tissue. So it prevents those ventricles from properly filling up and pumping out blood. And um, it can lead to patient having signs and symptoms of heart failure. And typical treatment for this is a pericardiectomy, which is where they go in surgically and remove the pericardium. Now, let's look at the complications because that leads me into the complications of pericarditis. 
Okay, another complication other than constrictive pericarditis is pericardial effusion. This is where in that pericardial space where that serous fluid, there's too much fluid that enters into that space and this can develop due to inflammation over time. And um, so you get all this fluid in that pericardial sac. This in turn can become very dangerous if not treated appropriately or they catch this fast. And the patient can enter into cardiac tamponade, which I'll talk about a little bit later whenever I'm talking about nursing interventions. And a treatment for this pericardial effusion, because they want to go in and remove that extra fluid that's in that pericardial sac, is called a pericardial synthesis. And this is where they go in with a sterile needle and they remove excessive fluid from the pericardial sac. Now a patient can develop um, also another complication is they can have both. They can have the effusion and the constrictive together where it would be an effusion constrictive pericarditis. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms and the nursing interventions and the pharmacological treatments. First, signs and symptoms. What are the typical signs and symptoms that you're gonna see in a patient with pericarditis? Okay, to help you remember this, remember the word friction because the problem with pericarditis is that inflammation is causing those layers to rub up against each other. So that is why the patient is having a lot of pain, especially chest pain. So remember the word friction to help you remember all those other signs and symptoms. Okay, first, F, friction rub. Whenever you're listening with your stethoscope, you will hear over the heart what is called a pericardial friction rub. And what this sounds like, it sounds like a grating, harsh sound of two things sliding up against each other, sort of like sandpaper. Also, the patient will have a fever, so that's the other F. Next, R for radiating substernal pain that can radiate to the left shoulder, the neck, the back. It's very similar to the pain that a patient may have whenever they're having a myocardial infarction. So the patient will probably think I'm having a heart attack. Next, I for increased pain in the supine position. Whenever the patient lays flat, they're gonna notice that their chest hurts a lot more than whenever they're setting up or leaning forward. So that's another telltale sign. Hey, this is probably not a myocardial infarction since positioning is making the chest pain worse. Next, C for chest pain. Like I said, big hallmark thing with this is the chest pain and that pericardial friction rub. And like I said, the patient's gonna feel like they are having a heart attack. Next, T for trouble breathing when lying down. Again, that goes back to the supine position. They're gonna be feeling more pain and they notice that it's hard to breathe too whenever they're laying on their back. And then I for in, whenever they're ha like in, having inspiration or they're coughing, they notice that the pain is increasing as well because whenever you're coughing or breathing in, those lungs are expanding, pushing more on that heart, causing those layers to rub even more and that inflammation really hurts. O for overall just feeling sick and weak. They feel yucky but and they're also having these other signs and symptoms as well. And then N for noticeable ST segment elevation. So on an EKG, you will see those ST segments elevated. Now, right here, I have these little asterisks that are orange it's for the friction rub, the increased pain, the substernal pain, the chest pain, and breathing. Whenever they breathe in, it causes them more pain. Those are typically your most common signs and symptoms, your hallmark signs of pericarditis. Now let's look at the nursing interventions. What are we gonna do for this patient to make them more comfortable? Okay, first, what we wanna do as a nurse we, is we want to assess their pain. This can be very painful, so we wanna make sure we're utilizing what the physician has ordered to give them for pain, which we'll go over those medications here in a second. Next, we wanna teach the patient about setting in the high Fowler's position or leaning forward because that helps relieve pain and to avoid lying down in that supine position because they'll have more pain with that. Next, we want to monitor for cardiac tamponade. Remember, this is where there is excessive fluid, the pericardial effusion in the pericardial sac, and it's compressing the heart. So some signs and symptoms for that. 
Number one, pulsus paradoxus. What is this? This is whenever the patient breathes in the inspiratory phase, there is a 10 millimeter of mercury drop in the systolic blood pressure. Next, they may have JVD, which is jugular venous distension, but they don't have, but they have clear lungs. Normally in heart failure, you have JVD and you're gonna hear um, crackles throughout the lungs. They're gonna have swelling because of that increased pressure of fluid in the body. But here, they don't have that. They'll have the increased jugular distension with clear lungs. So that is a warning sign that, hey, this patient is probably in this condition. And whenever you listen to those heart sounds, they're going to be muffled. You're not going to be able to hear them very well. And the reason for this is because there's a buildup of fluid in the heart. So it's muffling out those heart sounds you would normally hear because that layer surrounding the heart is keeping those sounds in there. The patient will also be tachycardic and hypotensive. Okay, let's look at the medications. What is typically given in pericarditis? Um, as prescribed by the physician, they may order aspirin or an NSAID. What is an NSAID? It's a little acronym for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Remember, we have inflammation problems in pericarditis, itis, that's inflammation. So we're gonna give them something to combat that, anti-inflammatory. Typically a popular one is ibuprofen. However, with ibuprofen, you have to watch for GI upset and bleeding with this drug. So as a nurse, you want to make sure you're administering this to the patient with a full glass of water. Another drug that may be used is colchicine. This helps decrease inflammation. It's also used in patients who are suffering from gout. And with colchicine, there is an increased risk of getting toxic with this drug and you need to educate the patient that they do not take colchicine with grapefruit juice because it increases the risk of them becoming toxic with this drug. Your body absorbs too much of the drug than it normally should. And you can take this drug with or without food and some early signs of toxicity are nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. So if your patient starts having that all of a sudden after they've been taking colchicine, you need to educate them about that, they may be toxic. Another thing that may be used whenever the patient's not really responding to these other medications are corticosteroids. And um, this just helps decrease the inflammation and one drug used sometimes is called prednisone. So that is about pericarditis. Now go to my website, registerednursrn.com and take the free NCLEX quiz that will test you on this condition. And thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.